you guys that are under 40 will probably laugh at me, but I didn't have a computer. I went all the way through college without a computer. The first computer I had was in graduate school. So I, you know, that was because the, there wasn't a thing, right? And if you did, you couldn't afford it. It filled like a room up and all this kind of stuff. But I remember the first time I did a Bible program, I was so excited on my computer. It came in a box about this wide with about 15 or 20 floppy disks, not the little ones. Remember the big ones, right? And for like two days, I was shoving in, you know, disks. I was just the man. I was so excited. I was so amazed at technology. It's like, look, I just keep shoving these disks in, you know? And, and then later on, the small ones, you know, the five, whatever, the five and a half, those little ones came out, right? And then it was like, whoa, these are just like super fast, you know? I remember the first time I did a download online, it was like, well, where's the disks? I, you know, I, I paid for it. Where's the thing, you know? And it's like, three, bing, bong, that whole thing, right? And it's like, you know, all night long, and the next day, it's like, hey, there it is. It's so cool, right? I downloaded a massive Bible program. I mean, gigabytes of data, you know, huge. It was about three minutes on my computer this last week, and I was just blown away. Like, you know, things have really changed in the download world. I was uh, just thinking about that as I was preparing the scriptures this week, and I thought about the times that I feel like God has given me a spiritual download. I don't know if you've experienced that or not, but there's times in my life where I'm really struggling with something or I'm seeking God in something and sometimes it's in the context of church, sometimes it's in just my own time with the Lord and God just does this download for me. I feel like tonight this scripture that we're looking at, that's the heart of Paul. I think Paul is saying there's, there's this download that God wants to do directly into your heart. So I, I'm, I'm hoping and I'm praying that that's going to be the case and I, you know, I think it, maybe it's already started to happen as some of you have been reading ahead and praying during the week. But very, very excited about what he wants to do tonight, and he wants to give us this powerful download. So let's look at the last half of Ephesians. I'll start reading in uh, verse 15, and just read to the end. For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation, the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all, have you seen a period yet? <laughs> Not yet. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named. Not only in this age, but also in the age to come. Oh, there's the first one. Thank you. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So in verse 15, we get this really personal sort of relational thing that Paul is thinking about this church. And we're not totally sure, but it could have been up to four years when this was written since he was in Ephesus. So it's been a number of years. Of course, we talked about last week, Paul was in prison at this time, and, and his fate was uncertain. It was hanging in the balance for quite some time in Rome there, whether he was going to live or die. And yet in the middle of that being uh, imprisoned, he had some freedom. People could come and go. But, you know, he talks about this book and says, I've, been, I've heard of your faith toward all the saints, and I don't cease to give thanks for you. This is just more of this apostolic ministry, this, this sent ministry that we talked about last week. The true nature of the apostolic ministry, of true apostolic ministry, is not structural. It's not some kind of you know, CEO chart, this is the big guy, and here's the little guy, and here's the really little guy. Apostolic is not like that. It's based on relationship, and that's what I love so much about what we see in the churches. And like I mentioned before, Paul and Katie going up to Terrace and and Prince George just two weeks ago. It's all just based on relationship. And so we see that, uh, that heart for Paul. And even though his fate was uncertain, and if, you know, any time you could have been woe is me kind of a thing, I, his heart is, my mind is on you. My heart is on you, and I'm thinking of you guys. So I just love that about, about the apostolic and what, what God does with the apostolic. Um, so what was he praying? He talks about my prayers for them. What was the things he was praying for these new Christians? I think the first thing we see in verse 17, he's praying for sort of a threefold gift from God for them. Uh, he talks about 
the, the Spirit, if you notice in your verse, in, in, your, in, your, in your Bible in verse 17, you might have caught it in there, the Spirit of Wisdom, Spirit is capitalized. Now that's an editor's attempt to say this is a, this is a specific, it's not just a, a Spirit, small s, but is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. So we see that Paul's talking about these three things are coming from, the source is coming from the Holy Spirit. And what's he praying for this church for? Well, three things. One is he's praying for wisdom. And I would say wisdom is, is applied knowledge. Uh, so, you know, what's the old joke? Uh, knowledge is that tomatoes are a fruit. Wisdom is not putting them in the fruit salad, right? So that's, that's knowledge applied, right? That's what he's talking about with wisdom. And he's certainly praying for wisdom. Wisdom is like... You know, I don't have snow tires on the car, and my tires are fairly getting thin. I probably shouldn't drive over the Malahat in the snow. It's something I know, but, but I'm applying that, and there's a wisdom in that. So I think what Paul's praying for is there's stuff already that you know, Christians, or church you guys know, but I'm praying that you can apply that and start to move that into life. So he prays for wisdom, and then he prays for revelation. This is one of my favorite things to pray for, and it's something I pray for us every week as we come into Thursday night, is revelation. And I think just a real quick definition of revelation is it's unfiltered enlightenment direct from God, not processed by another. I love preaching. I love to go to church. I love to hear people like look at videos of teaching. It's great to read books of people who have written stuff in the Lord. Those are all really, really good things, but they're kind of secondhand, if you know what I mean. It's somebody else has chewed on that thing and they've kind of made it a little easier to digest. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's really good. I mean, we're doing that tonight, and that's, I think it's a good thing that we're doing. But Revelation's a little bit different. Revelation is coming directly from God. And if you've walked with the Lord for a while, maybe you know what I'm talking about. There are times when God reveals something to you without anybody else sort of being involved. You know, it's something that he talks about directly. This happens to me fairly regularly when I'm reading my Bible. Uh, I just, Dean and I have had a habit since we were teenagers of just reading our Bible every day, spending some time in the Bible, and um, we just read through the Bible. I read through the Bible every year, and some days it's kind of like, well, that was good. I mean, I did it, right? But there are other days where something really jumps out at me in the Word of God. Maybe I've read that thing 10 or 15 times before, but I see it in a new way, and, and the Lord highlights, the Holy Spirit highlights something. That's revelation. That's God bringing something very directly in from His Word or from His from his heart into my heart without any intermediary. So Paul's praying, I not only want you to have wisdom, but I want you to have revelation. John 14, 25 and 26 says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring your remembrance all that I have said to you. Um, we have an amazing privilege. We talked about last week that we are sealed in the Holy Spirit. If you know Jesus, the Holy Spirit's resident in you. There's a lot of things the Holy Spirit does in our lives, but one of the things that's so great is He's our teacher. I cannot tell you how many times, as I'm preparing for something or just even thinking about something in the Word of God, I don't understand it. And I'm like, Lord, I can't get my head around this thing. I'll just stop and say, Holy Spirit, will you help me and give me insight into what this is? And there'll be something I had not thought of before or a resource God will bring apart or a conversation with another Christian or some teaching on Sunday that brings God into that. And that's the Holy Spirit being our teacher. So I think it's very exciting in this issue of Revelation that when you're stuck, pray, just pray. Lord, will you help me? Holy Spirit, will you enlighten me into this word? I don't understand this. And just, it's very exciting when God starts to do that, like directly. Um, but he's, Paul's praying for Revelation. The third thing we see in 17 is knowledge. And this is the one we kind of get the easiest. Basically, knowledge is facts based on the truth of God's perspective. So knowledge is just things we know, uh, but I always say it from God's perspective. There's a lot of people that you know have their truth. That's kind of a, a thing you hear about my truth nowadays. I just want to scream every time I hear that on the TV or whatever. You know, it's like my truth. Well, now wait a minute. It's either truth or not truth, but I understand what they're saying. But but from God's perspective, that's knowledge. Um, so an illustration kind of from last week's scriptures. Uh, you know, if we talk about what we, we reviewed last week in the first half of the chapter, as a Christian, I've been chosen and adopted by God. That's knowledge. You know, I know that from that scripture, as I start to understand it, we were wrestling with that a little bit last week. I've been adopted by God. I know that. 
And then the Lord uses that and brings that back over time. Um, one of the things that somebody got me doing probably when I was about I don't know, maybe 13 or 14 or 15, a uh, uh, Campus Crusade for Christ guy that was kind of a leader on my, in my campus, just challenged me and a number of six or eight guys to read through the Bible every year. To read the Bible one time in, in one year. And I was like freaked out because, you know, I wasn't that great a reader or whatever, a studier. I'd never had done that. And, but we read through that whole Bible together the first year. And then at the end of the year, he said, you know what? Just keep doing it. Well, 40 years later, I just kept doing his advice. And basically just every year I read through the Bible. And sometimes it's not that exciting. You know, you're in Deuteronomy 13 with skin diseases, you know, and if the pus is red, the pus is not white, and you take it, you know, it's like, come on, you know. But what I've learned about reading through the Word of God and just every day putting that into your life is there's a cumulative effect in that. And lots and lots of times now I'll be thinking of something or somebody will ask a question and it's like my mind goes, hey, there's a scripture in there. How did I know that? Not because I studied that. It's just that over the years I've been putting that in and I'm pleased to keep on doing that now. Uh, I'm trying it on my phone for the first time this year. I'm driving myself crazy, but I'm, I'm reading the Bible on my phone trying to get into the 21st century. So I'm trying to learn some new tricks. But, you know, 10 minutes or 15 minutes a day is really all it takes to read through the Word of God. And there's great uh, one-year Bibles you can use and electronically. And there's different formats if you want to ask me because I've tried a whole bunch of them over the years. But um, So that thing about knowledge is when, when God talks about the Holy Spirit bringing back to mind, where did that come from originally? It's something that you stored away maybe 10 years ago, something you read about skin diseases or whatever there wasn't that big a thrill that morning when you spent time with the lord but the holy spirit brings that back to mind so it's just this constant sort of over time the lord you know we used to say throw enough mud against the wall some's bound to stick right but that's there's a cumulative effect of the word of god and i think paul's praying for that with these guys he says i'm praying for knowledge but not just that you know stuff even though he had a bible school he taught every night probably for two or two years in that town uh, not just that you know stuff, but you have wisdom. That means you know how to apply it. It's like, okay, I know this thing, but now this is going to change how I live my life this week. That's wisdom. But even more than that, he's praying for revelation, that direct download from God that didn't come through anybody else or through any other intermediary. You just felt the Lord bring that into your life. So pretty cool prayer for three things. Okay, let's go on. 18 and 19. Seems like Paul's in threes. He's, he's, he's all about threes in the scriptures tonight. So we get three more things. And he's now, in the, in the light of that, of those three, he's talking about three results that he'd like to have come from that in verse 18 and 19. And I love this scripture in 18. He says, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. I've just been captivated by that all week, thinking about what does it mean to have the eyes of my heart enlightened? The heart in, in the New Testament is, is sort of the center of your being. You know, it's not your mind, which is good, right? It's, it's the center of your being. And Paul's saying, I want those three things to have some impacts at the very center of your being, at your, the center of your core, if you want to say it that way. The Hebrew concept was more like stomach, <laughs> you know, in the Old Testament. But it, when the Greeks came in, it was more kind of like heart. But he talks about having the eyes of your heart enlightened. And I just, it's again, I'm praying for that tonight. I've been praying all week that we would together tonight experience having the light of our, of our hearts enlightened. Um, so very cool. He's talking about that. But he's talking about, again, three parts. He says, here's what, I'm, what I would like to see in the application of that. Three things. The first is I'd like to see hope, uh, that you may know what the hope is to which he's called you. There's lots of definitions of hope. I, a quick one would just be an expectant attitude. That's a quick way to say what hope is. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 is a great definition of hope. It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. So the essence of hope is there's something that's coming down the pipe that you haven't experienced yet, but you know and have a confident assurance that it will happen. That's the essence of what is about Christianity. The things that God has said, the promises he's given to us about the second return of Christ and our are you know, being gathered to heaven and, and my being in his presence when I die someday. That's the hope that he's talking about, this, this expectant attitude. I was thinking about this. This is actually a pretty radical concept when you think about who this was written to. Because polytheism was what Ephesians, Ephesus was all about. Polytheism means more than one God. 
So in Ephesus, we talked a little bit about last week, there's all these different gods, and you see that in Athens when Paul goes in Athens. This is very normal in the first century in the Greek culture. The Greeks basically took all the Roman, I mean the Romans took all the Greeks' gods and just kind of rebranded them, if you noticed, remember in grade six when you, yeah, anyway. So there's all these different gods, and, and Ephesus would have been a, a city like that where you would have to go and you'd have to appease these different kinds of gods. Of course, Artemis was the, that was the temple of Artemis, so that was kind of the, the king god. She was kind of over all the gods. But it must have been very tiring if you were into that thing apart from Christ. Did I do enough? Did I get the right God? Did I sacrifice enough stuff? Am, is my crops going to grow? Am I going to be able to, are my children going to thrive in health? You know, it must have been very tiring to wonder, did I do enough stuff, right? And there's this uncertainty always built into polytheism like, I don't know, maybe it, maybe it was the wrong guy. Maybe I said the wrong thing. Ephesus was all about spell, spells and incantations and magic. And did I get it right? Did I do the right thing? Did I get it in the right order? You can imagine how disturbing that would be. You know, when you're talking about eternity and life and death and success and all those kinds of things. So when Paul talks about hope, that having the eyes of our heart enlightened, that's a very, very different concept. That confident assurance of the things that are not yet seen, I know they're coming because of the promise of God. Very cool. So he, wants, he talks about hope. The eyes of your heart would be enlightened, the hope in which he's called you. And then he talks about inheritance, um, that you would know the inheritance you have in the saints. And we talked about this last week. That was really a reference, I think, back to the first half of chapter 1, those of you that have been thinking about this book. That inheritance, all those things that were given. Remember, we talked about the firstborn son in the Jewish context gets all the marbles. And God has given Jesus all of this stuff, and the scripture is saying Jesus gives this stuff to us. We have this inheritance. We're like firstborn sons, whether we're men or women or fourthborn or whatever. There, you know, when we come into a relationship with Christ, we have an inheritance. And Paul's reminding them of that, that we have this inheritance in the saints. We have this together, all of us together as a church, as an individual, as the church across the world, a church across all time. We have this inheritance that God is giving us. And this is part of this enlighten, the enlightening of our hearts. So inheritance. And the third thing he talks about uh, in 19 is this immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. Now, this is a big deal. He spends the rest of the chapter just in power, talking about power. So we really need to think about tonight. I think that's the central focus. So he talks about power. And to explain how much power he's trying to get across, he actually uses four different words, four different Greek terms. This is really typical of Paul. Sometimes he just piles up synonyms, words that sort of mean the same thing, because it, it matters so much to him. He's trying to make a point that's so critical and so real. He just piles them up. Well, this is a, a good illustration. So he uses the word power, which you could say is inherent ability, capability, or potential. That's a decent understanding of that word. Inherent ability, capability, or potential. But he talks about working. Working is an operative power. That's like the use of power. It's not just that you have power, but working is you're using it to do something. Okay, so you've got you know, a tractor that's got you know, 80 horsepower. It has it sitting in the barn, but you don't really do anything until you hook a plow up to it. Then it's doing something. That's, that's working. It's using the power. And then he talks about great might. And this could be like um, manifested strength. So great might is, is a display of that power. Talks about this in, in verse uh, 19. And then the last word he uses in the next verse is exerted. This is a, it gets translated a couple of ways, but a power as an endowment or the possession of power. Okay, so I don't think the, the distinction between the four words is so critical. Sometimes Paul uses words and you need to look into each one and like he's, he's kind of making nuances and I think he's just dumping it all in the truck to blow our minds to talk about look at the power we have as Christians. All these different words he can think of to talk about this immeasurable greatness of the power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might. So he's really, really focusing on power in this situation. And let's go in and, and look a little bit closer at that because that's really what the rest of the chapter is about. So what's the source of this power? He's made a really big point to talk about all this power that we're receiving from God and that's giving, given to us in our inheritance. What's the source of this power? Um, and we see this starting in verse 20 to 23. Before I get into that, I want to just ask again, why would he be emphasizing power to this group of people? I mean, this is the, we're not even into the letter, you know, 
16 or 18 verses, and he's talking about power, and he spends the whole rest of the chapter on power. There must have been something going on with this church, with this city, with these people, that he, he knew that, look, right out of the chutes, i got to get to this issue of power. And I think what you think about that is when you start to go through the issue of this background in Ephesus, and I want you to go back to Acts with me. I referred to this just a little bit last week, but I want to dig into Acts a little bit. And this is going to get where your question was going. But look at Acts chapter 19. So you see the history of the church plant in Ephesus in Acts chapter 18 and 19. That's the historical travel log sort of of Acts. But in Acts 19, look what we see in verse 11. This just gives you a little feel about what was going on in Ephesus. And I think it helps us understand why was Paul talking about power to this particular group. Look in verse 11. So God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and the diseases left them and evil spirits came out of them. <laughs> That's pretty radical power right there. Can you imagine? Just, you know, <laughs> this is a clean one, so relax. I haven't used it yet. It's okay. It's like, Lord, I bless this hanky, and uh, this is a cure for cancer. Take this to your auntie. You know, two days walk over to your auntie, and you lay this on your auntie, and she's cured from cancer, right? That's pretty, that's pretty radical power, but God was displaying that kind of power in the contest of Ephesus. So that's interesting right there. Now look in verse uh, 13, or verse 12. Sorry, 13. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists... So these would be guys who wouldn't be Christians, but they'd come out of the Jewish faith. Itinerant means they would travel around sort of exorcist for hire, sort of, you know, I don't know how else to say it. But they undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. So why did they do that? Because everywhere the Christians go in the, in the book of Acts, when they're dealing with demonic forces, they have authority. And you just see over and over again, Jesus is casting out demons the apostles are casting out demons. Regular people are dealing with demons. When they come across different problems, they just say, okay, this is what the, it's a hassle. We're going to deal with it. In the name of Jesus be gone. We just see that over and over. So it must have been going on here in Ephesus too because these traveling guys said, hey, this is, a, this is kind of a slick deal. You say the name of Jesus and it works and we make some money, right? So they're kind of thinking, oh, this is a shortcut to you know, making a little dough, right? <laughs> Not such a great plan. Uh, so they would say, I adjure you by Jesus whom Saul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. Now in verse 15, now it goes horribly wrong. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit leapt out of them mastered them all and overpowered them. So they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all. And the name of Jesus was the Lord Jesus was highly extolled. That's pretty powerful stuff. Somebody's messing with the name of Jesus that doesn't know Jesus, thinking it's going to be an income stream, and you see the demonic, you know, recognize the fault in that, and, uh, you know, these guys get the tar beat out of them, you know, and then everybody else kind of goes, whoa, what's up with the name of Jesus? Well, what's up with the name of Jesus is power, and the demons recognize that, but they also recognize when someone was trying to fake it out and didn't really have that relationship. Uh, so this is just interesting context to see all the spirituality, all this stuff that was going on in Ephesus, you know, in terms of what's there. So you can see why Paul would be talking to this church about power. This was a city who were, who were consumed with power. They wanted to know where is the, where's the beef, if you're old enough to remember that ad, you know. Where's the, where's the spiritual power? Where's the real spiritual power? Who's got the most, right? So we see that coming through. Um, and now this is cool in verse 18. Also, many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. So a lot of these people that were doing sorcery and doing witchcraft and doing magic stuff and had books and spells, they, they came to know Christ. They saw a greater power in Jesus and accepted Christ. 19, and a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. <laughs> This is so old. I'm sorry. I'm just dating myself. Any of you had come out of rock and roll culture when you got saved? I mean, big time rock and roll. Did you, did you burn any albums? Do you remember, do you remember burning albums? 
Sorry. <laughs> I, had some, I had some friends that did that. Like, I was so into this, I wouldn't even give you any band names. I was so into this, but I'm into Jesus now, and I can't have this in my house, and we would burn these records, right? Okay, so it makes a really gross smell, but anyway. <laughs> sort of the same thing. These guys who had spent a lot of money on these books and all this ancient stuff and all this, this occult stuff brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted the value of them and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. That's a ton of money. I mean, there's different ways to translate. That is a lot of dough. And the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. So that's the context. You see a little bit about what was going on in this church in the early days of the church and, the, and what they were up against in terms of this, this culture. And I think what Paul is saying is, look, power matters. It matters. I mean, it, it, authority, I think, is the, is the currency of the, in the spiritual realm. And I think Paul's saying, you have a right to say, who has the most power? I've talked to uh, people who are missionaries and, and have gone into places where there's just a whole lot of occult stuff, and maybe Christianity hasn't gone into there. We're going to have Ivor and Jackie Lewis are going to be here this next week. They've traveled to places where you know, that Christianity wasn't even known. No one even knew the name of Jesus. And, and they said the first thing that happens with all the witch doctors and all the guys is, do you have more power than we do? The whole village is looking. Like, okay, hot shot, show us your stuff because I'm not interested in following you if I'm going to get my teeth kicked out by this other small G God. So they would see lots of powerful things happen in that context. I think that's exactly what was happening in the book of Ephesus. God was showing himself with the hankies and with the, all this kind of stuff that there is a greater power here, a real power, an authentic power coming through the power of the Holy Spirit in these Christians and it's worth throwing all that stuff away that you thought was so important before. Where's the source of this power? So where does it come from? Look in verse 20. This all comes through Christ. And, it, and so Paul focuses all this stuff into this working and according to the power of his great might. And then it all focuses in on Jesus. In verse 20, he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. So the first power that we see displayed here through Jesus is the power over death. And when you think about it, that's one of the, that's one of the biggest deals in our life, right? It, you get a one... 100% chance that you're going to die, you know? We're all going to die, uh, and it's the one thing we can't escape, um, you know? And yet, God, through his power, raised Jesus from the dead. He was dead, way dead, you know, two days stinky dead, kind of dead, right? In three days, and God raised him from the dead. And so this is what Paul's beginning to talk about. I want you to see the, the locus or the center of this power. It's all focused on who Jesus is. This is the kind of power that he says I'm talking about. I'm talking about power that raises dead people to life. So he talks about that in Christ, working when he raised him from the dead. Uh, and then power over the enemy death, but then power over everything created. We raised Christ and raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places. Right hand is an important word. It's not just random. In Jewish culture, when you would go to a banquet, the person who sat to the host's right at the head of the table was the honored person. Uh, remember the, the mom who came up to Jesus with the two little sons, the disciples? Hey, Jesus, I got a favor. Can you put one of my boys and one on your right and one on your left in heaven? How do you think that went over the rest of the apostles? They're like, come on, you've got to be kidding, right? Jesus is like, you don't even have a, no, you don't even know what you're asking, but that right hand is, a, is the place of honor. And what God has done is God has taken Christ, raised him from the dead, and seated him at his right hand. So that's real important what he's talking about. So the seating at the right hand in the heavenly places. Now we get to this issue of far above all rule and authority and powers and dominions over every name in his name, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. So this, again, Paul's kind of running out of words. Like Jesus has all authority, everything. God took everything that he had and he gave that to Jesus. There's not one thing in heaven, on earth, and under the earth that's not... Uh, under the authority of Jesus. Look at Philippians 2, 5, if you, if you want to get another good one on this. Um, Paul's talking to a church about uh, unity, and he, he brings up the humility of Christ. And then in verse 5, talking about Jesus, he says, Have this mind above yourselves, about yourselves, which is in Christ Jesus. Though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with a thing to be grasped, Emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, that means he comes to earth, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form. He humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Verse 9. 
Therefore God has exalted him highly and bestowed him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. That's pretty uh, comprehensive. <laughs> I can't think of another place, right? Heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Now, as Christians, we have done that. The scripture talks about if you confess Jesus with your mouth and believe in your heart, you will be saved. We've confessed him as Lord. Not everyone, of course, has done that yet. But at the end, even those who've resisted him are going to have to admit, when it all comes down, that he is Lord. And God has given him that title. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 24, another big one in this area. But sort of like, how does this all turn out? Because obviously this is not all taking place yet. It's true in the heavenly realms, but earth is still a big mess, right? And, and the demonic is still a big mess. But look how it turns out. 1 Corinthians 15, 24. Um, speaking of Christ, when then comes the end, when God delivers the kingdom, when he delivers the kingdom of God to the Father, speaking of Jesus, after destroying every rule and every authority and every power, for he must reign until he's put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it's plain he's accepted to put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will be subjected to him and put all things in subjection under him, so God may be at all in all. That's a little bit confusing, but what it, what it means is we win. <laughs> Jesus wins. In the end, there's still a tussle right now on earth. He's settled in heaven. He's seated at the right hand in heaven. But there's this tussle going on now on earth, and the demonic is still running around mucking things up. But in the end, all that gets settled, and it's not even a battle. The angels, the heavenly angels deal with those guys. It's one word, you know, because, because that, the battle has already been lost on the cross. So this is where we see this power all focusing in on Jesus, and Paul's trying to help us to see how huge the power of Jesus is. It's, it's completely the power of God the Father given to, to Jesus. There is no realm that's outside of the power of Jesus. There's no foe that can come against Jesus and be like Star Wars. Is he going to win? Is he going to not? There's no yin or yang with Jesus. He's complete, he has complete authority over everything. So that's where Paul's he's, he's having a hard time finding the words. And it's hard for us to see. But I think he's wanting him to see, look how big Jesus is. Look at the power that Jesus has. Um, so what's so neat about this? Then we start to think through at the end of what he wrote here. He says to put all things under his feet over all things, the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So here's the killer. Jesus has all this power, but not only has God given Jesus all this power, Jesus is also delegating and relegating that power and authority to us, to Christians. This is the connection that Paul's making at the end. So when you read last week, I don't know if you noticed, but there's so many in Christ no, 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 in Christ. Did you notice there's like six or eight of them? No, 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 in Christ. Christians are in Christ. And Paul's at the end here talking about not only are we in Christ, he's the head and we're actually his body. That's what we are as Christians. We're, we're his body on earth. We're hands and feet and the working out and the voice. And, you know, it seems sort of reckless for God to give us that kind of authority, but he entrusted us with it. And that's really what the essence of the body of Christ is. And that's what he's talking about, the fullness of who fills all in all. Jesus is complete. He's not lacking anything. We're not you know, making up something he lacks because he's complete. But he's chosen to allow us to be his body and his representative on earth. And we're walking out, and that power has been given to us. We have a delegated power authority from Jesus. Matthew 28, 18, Great Commission, you know it. We always think about the go part, but listen to the first part. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Isn't that what Paul just said? He's summarizing. It's all, I got all the marbles. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus is saying, all this power that I have, I am delegating that power to you in my name because you are my body. <laughs> you know, I'm the head and you are the body. You start to see the connection here. So I think what Paul's trying to do is, first off, blow these Christians' minds about the authority of what it means that Jesus has power in the midst of this culture where power is, you know, everything. 
He's like, we got a power here that's completely above all that. But more than that, he's saying it's not just that Jesus has that power. Paul's saying to this church, you have that power. It's a delegated power given to you through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in you to do what God has called you to do. I love <laughs> Aladdin. <laughs> when the genie comes out of the bottle, he's got the song. There's a couple different iterations. One of the lines in the song is, you got some heavy ammunition in your camp. Remember that one? <laughs> heavy ammunition in your camp. That's what we got as Christians. We got some heavy ammunition in our camp. Okay, so what's the take home for tonight? You can kind of guess where I'm going here, but um, it might be that you're feeling powerless and maybe you're even overwhelmed in your life by an area of evil or something that's coming against you in your life. Um, a lot of my Christian life if I was honest, was sp spent very much uh, in a powerless Christianity. I knew a lot of stuff, uh, and I knew the truth of this stuff, but I don't know why I didn't do it, but you know, I'll give you an illustration. Dean and I, we started a church in the late 80s in Seattle called Solid Rock Church, and it was just very hip, and Thursday nights, I had a great band with a saxophone, and of course, we're in Seattle where Starbucks started, so we had to have really cool coffee, you know, and, um, you know, really relational sermons and all this kind of stuff, right? And yeah, people got saved. I'm so glad for that. The church grew and all this kind of stuff. But it was all very much human energy. It was all very much just, you know, white-knuckling personality, you know, kind of stuff. And I remember um, a couple of things now as I look back on it. Before I would come in to preach on Thursday nights, I would get horrible, debilitating back pain. I didn't have any back problems. I didn't have any back pain any other time. But within about an hour before church started and I was going to preach, I would get this horrible, we were meeting in a hotel, I would get this horrible, horrible back pain. And it was kind of like, at that time, I was like, oh, that's weird. Uh, you know, oh, this is really sucks. I can't stand up. You know, I'm trying to preach, right? And then I'd, church would be over and, I would, and it would go away every week, week in and week out. Now, I wasn't smart enough, and we weren't smart enough to know about, you know, spiritual warfare, and we weren't even understanding the Holy Spirit much at that time in our life, and so we didn't get that, but, but we were living a powerless Christianity and getting our teeth kicked in from the enemy. I remember one time, uh, as the pastor of that church, some people got involved in the church that owned a hotel. It was a really seedy part of town, it's kind of that, you know, one of those ones you can rent two hours at a time kind of, you know, uh, hotel. And there was all this bad stuff that was starting to happen. People overdosing and stabbing and just all this horrible stuff in their hotel. And they said, would you come and pray? You know, we want to see Christ in our hotel, right? And I remember walking up thinking like, oh, here's Pastor Mark here, you know, the man of the hour, you know. And as I walked around, I realized I don't have anything to say. I had some puny little prayer like, oh, God, you know, kind of bless this, kind of, you know, bless. I didn't have a clue about what, what we were into in that situation with the darkness in that place of that hotel they bought because we just were living a powerless life. Um, now since then, God's gracious. He's helped us to understand the Holy Spirit and walk in the Holy Spirit and begin to see that we went through the reality of spiritual warfare and learned about that, and we're still learning. And I'll tell you some of those stories maybe later on as we get to the end of the book here. But... Um, but we don't have to live a powerless Christian life. It's not how God intended us to be. It's not the normal Christian life from God's perspective. You know, we look at the book of Acts with the handkerchiefs and we go, wow, that's crazy. It blows my mind. Well, that's actually probably normative Christianity. And maybe we need to get back to that understanding of what the power is and learn how do we start to exercise that power for your glory, Lord. Um, there's a neat scripture in Isaiah 54. I never understood it. I read it lots of times as I read through the Bible. And, and uh, just in the last number of years, I've started to see it a little differently. But it says, Behold, I have created the smith who blows the fire of coals and produces a weapon for his purpose. He's talking about blacksmiths, you know, make in the fire, right? I think that's where it starts, the illustration. God says, I've created that guy who makes those weapons. But then it goes on and says, I have also created the ravager to destroy. No weapon 
that's fashioned against you shall succeed, and you shall refute every tongue that rises against you in judgment. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their vindication from me, declares the Lord. This is speaking before the cross, you know, to, to the nation of Israel. Uh, and I just think that, that the whole point of this scripture is this download to say we are powerful in Jesus. We are powerful in Jesus, and that power comes for purposes for his glory. So let's just pray. Uh, for a second, I'm going to have, if the ministry team would, would come up, that'd be awesome. Um, Lord, I thank you that you have given us great power. First off, I just thank you, God, that you've given Jesus great power. We just start right now and just say, Jesus, you have all authority. We declare, we agree with you, the reality of who you are, Jesus, that in heaven and on earth and under the earth, there's nothing that you don't have authority over. So thank you for that right there, God. God, we just thank you for the absolute power and absolute authority you have in Jesus. But more than that, it blows our mind that, Jesus, you are sharing that with us. And God, I really pray that in my life, in our life together, in the life of our church, we would begin to see the outflow of that power in greater ways, God. Uh, not for our glory, not for our thrill ride, you know, but for your glory and for your kingdom. Lord, I pray that the people in Nanaimo would know the name of Jesus on their lips as a powerful name, not just a swear word, God, but, a, but the, the only true God. And so, Lord, I, I don't understand why you involved in this. It seems like I dropped the ball regularly in this, and yet you've, in your wisdom you've done this and given it to us as a church. We admit we are your body, God. We thank you for this, and God, we pray that we see this in greater ways in the time to come. Thank you, Lord. Amen.